Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is once again that time of the week where I come onto your radio dial, onto your airwaves, and drop some hard truths. This is the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program, only on 89.1 FM, WIDR Kalamazoo. And uh, this is a weekly show where we discuss politics, political strategy, um, and, and generally try to cut through the BS, talk about things that the establishment media is not, things the mainstream media will not touch, and, uh, you know, basically talk about things from that sort of uh, anti-establishment perspective. I want to start this show by saying, as we start every show, by saying the following thoughts, views, and opinions are not necessarily those of 89.1 FM, WIDR Kalamazoo, or Western Michigan University, no matter how dope or insightful they may be. Now, uh, we've got a lot to talk about on the show today. Uh, some, some of them, some of the, some of the topics, a little bit more well-known than others. I, I do want to start the show by saying, um, you know, my thoughts are with the victims of um, all of the victims of the Vegas shooting that happened just a few days ago. Um, you know, uh, we're, I'm going to get into that discussion a little bit more in depth later on in the show, um, particularly after my buddy and co-host Lawrence shows up. But I, I did just want to briefly say, you know, um, it's it's a it's a really it's a terrible tragedy, and it's one we've seen play out way too often, way way too often. So again, uh, we'll touch on that in a little bit more depth later on in the show. Um, there's a lot of issues to unpack from what happened in Vegas, but I wanted to start by talking about something a little bit more localized. Um, last night at the YWCA, there, uh, there was a domestic violence awareness, uh, march. And, uh, there were a couple of speakers, um... And uh, I'll read a little bit from the article. Um, uh, this is from Megan Beck on um, Live. And uh, w YWCA of Kalamazoo hosts an event for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. This was uh, posted October 3rd, which would have been yesterday. And their official statement... Um, YWCA Kalamazoo is calling on our community to join us in breaking the silence against domestic violence during the month of October. Grace uh, Labwama, uh, uh, CEO of YWCA Kalamazoo, said in a statement, We must come together as a community to declare that we will not accept domestic violence in our village. People can show their support every day by wearing a purple ribbon available at the YWCA during business hours. And uh, so, yeah, yesterday they had a march. Um, they had a couple of speakers. Um, and, and this is something that was a little problematic. I had a, a fellow activist. They brought this up and, and talked about it at length. Uh, there weren't any female speakers. Um, now, I have a clip I'm going to play from one of the speakers. He talks, you know, this is not strictly a, a female issue, of course. You know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of men uh, are the recipients of domestic violence. And, you know, a lot of people in the LGBTQ uh, community also deal with this. Um, uh, you know, in, in very um, alarming ways. But, um you know, one of the things that was missed... So, the first two speakers, we had uh, Richard Fuller, who's um, the, the elected uh, you know, Kalamazoo Sheriff. And we had uh, uh, Jeff Getting, who is the elected uh, prosecutor here. 
And, you know, both of them really talked about, like, oh, how much, how much progress we've made. Uh, you know, the central thesis, um, particularly of uh, Mr. Fuller's speech, was like, oh, we've made a lot of progress since my early years on the force. Um, Jeff Getting, it was his speech was more tooled around, like, we have to be there, we have to stand with the victims. Um, well, let's do a little bit of a reality check. Um, we live in a city where um, we've had resources pulled out of our d domestic violence programs. We live in a city where, uh, you know, as much progress has been made, and, you know, I'm not going to browbeat, you know, uh, Sheriff Fuller. I'm, I'm sure there has been progress, but uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, I hear stories nearly every day from, from people I love and care about where, you know, they... They deal with these domestic violence issues. They are in these horrible, abusive relationships. And um, the, the police, they're, they're, it's, there's a systemic problem where, you know, this issue is not either not handled seriously or there's just not enough personnel with the correct training to deal with domestic violence issues. I, I had a friend who was uh, essentially b being beaten by her husband and... When she reached out to the police about it, our, our local police here in Kalamazoo, essentially the response is like, you have to get him on video. You have to get him on video beating you. Um, obviously, you know, that's, that's clearly not acceptable. And uh, let, let's look further into, you know, uh, a lot of people will say, like, why don't you just leave them? Well, the infrastructure is just not there in our city for that. Um, you know, uh, if you leave an abuser, somebody who's violent, they're probably going to want uh, to, uh, in some way, give you some sort of repercussions. And uh, a lot of people would say, well, just get like, you know, a PPO, a p personal uh, protection order. That's not easy to get. That is not as easy to get as people think. Um, again, and you know, this is uh, this is anecdotal, but you know, there's I mean, there's statistics nationwide to back this up. Um, you know, I, I had a friend who like was being like habitually stalked by an abusive ex boyfriend, and they uh, they they sought out a personal protection order and essentially. Uh, went through an interview or, or almost like an interrogation for it where um, she didn't end up getting it because it, it was a lot of like you know uh, what was it victim victim blaming kinds of questions like oh well did you did you lead them on did you uh, why did you keep talking to them why did you do this why did you do that and even with those explanations they didn't get it also a lot of people don't know with personal protection orders, they will expire after about a year, and you cannot reapply for one unless there has been um, more abuse since the last. So, yeah, look, um, again, yeah, I'm sure it's better than like the 60s or 70s, you know, our, but we can't compare the goalposts to them. Um, the level in, of misogyny in our culture. You know, we, we've chipped away at it. And at you know, some points, like, we have really um, made significant progress in very short, short amounts of time. And, you know, there is a certain extent where, you know, we should be glad that our culture is not inherently as misogynistic and, um, like, abuser-friendly as it was in decades past. But it's still far too... I mean, just... You know, look at the greater overall culture. You know, that that um, that white boy um, uh, who who uh, he, you know he 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 raped a woman in an alley and got two to three months because the judge said, oh, it would ruin his life to to get like the the actual appropriate um, you know sentence for that crime. These, these are issues that are pervasive anywhere and everywhere. And uh, again, you know, sometimes they're issues of class. Sometimes they're issues of just rank misogyny. 
But, you know, let's... It, it was honestly pretty disturbing and a little gross to see um, our elected law officials, you know, uh, kind of clapping themselves on the back when there are still so many significant and terrible systemic problems that keep uh, victims from getting the kind of help and, and uh, uh, you know, legal support that they need. That 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 should not have been about where how far we've come. That conversation, that speech, it should have been a dialogue about what more can we do? What more can we do? What is still a problem? Perhaps they'd be open to that. I you know, uh I I invite them on the show and grow them about it, but that's got to be the question. What more can we do? To help victims of domestic violence in this city. Because I will tell you, it is still a huge problem. I cannot go a week without hearing one of these stories from one of my friends. And, you know, if they do reach out to law enforcement at all, nine times out of ten, they do not do what they're supposed to be doing. Nine times out of ten, my, my friend will tell me they wish they hadn't even bothered. And that's unacceptable. It really is. You know, if you, you know, like, if you listen to my show uh, enough, you know, like, I, I'm pretty radical. You know, I, I don't even know if we should have a, a, a police department, but if we're going to have one, it should be focused on protecting people in that way. In the ways that really matter. You know, like, so, something you know, a friend of mine pointed out is like, you know, they put more resources into, you know, drug arrests than they do into, uh, you know, seeking out and preventing domestic violence. And, and, you know, that's that's just unacceptable. And you know what? Yeah, maybe we are going in the right w- direction from where we've come from, but we can't, we cannot be complacent. We cannot be complacent. So, you know what? Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, Some of y'all listening probably know everything I'm talking about all too well. Some of you maybe not. It's time to talk about this. And it's time, particularly for those who hold the levers of power in this city, you got to see, like, what have you been doing right? And more importantly, what have you been doing wrong? What do you need to do better? If you got a story like that, Speak out to to you know the the the, the um you know the um you know uh, city prosecutor. Speak out to Sheriff Fuller. Um, I will tell you like you know the, the criticism I'm leveling now. Th- these people have been rece- been receptive to uh, um, public pressure and public demand. So you know if you have an experience with um, you know Kalamazoo public safety. Um, or with like you know uh, any of the like city groups that d- deal with this issue, let your voice be heard. Because we need to hear it right now. Because if you'd have gone to that meeting and not know anything about this topic, you would have thought, "Oh, everything's just fine and dandy in this city, and we're doing enough." Well, we're not. We are not. Our law enforcement is not. So I'm gonna play a quick clip from um, the event yesterday. So, uh, this is going to be Jay Maddock from Out Front. Partner violence. 
In fact, 61% of bisexual women have reported experiencing sexual assault or intimate partner violence, compared to just 44% of lesbians and 35% of heterosexual women. LGBT men who cohabitate with same-sex with same partners reported three times the rate of inter, in, intimate partner violence compared to men who cohabitated with women only. The research and studies that include LGBT populations are still limited, but it raises one thing for certain. We need to break our silence on LGBT communities' experience with intimate partner violence and raise awareness and create spaces for greater dialogue. You know, I think that there's a stigma and an assumption that uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence are only women. And we know that that's not correct. We know that men are also uh, survivors from domestic violence. But they also can be LGBTQ people. Uh, it's not just in heterosexual relationships. And the more we do to have conversations to break down the stigma that faces folks who want to report and talk about it, the better we can create a community uh, that is increasing the awareness and also increasing open and affirming spaces for all people to be able to report and find safety. Uh, the good news is Kalamazoo is doing just that. There's been a three-year-long partnership uh, between Outfront Kalamazoo and the YWCA to uh, you know, increase the spaces and the safe spaces for LGBT people to be able to report and have uh, safe uh, sanctuaries, whether they are trans men, trans women, lesbian, gay, or bisexual, uh, we are increasing the awareness to allow them to make sure that they have access uh, to resources as well. And we all have an opportunity to contribute to building a safer Kalamazoo for everyone. Uh, and to ensure that we are all increasing the amount of time that we take up talking about this important issue. Uh, we cannot be silent. We have to talk often uh, and raise awareness in this community so that we create more outlets for people to talk to. If we as individuals let the folks in our contact know that they can talk to us and that we have resources, maybe even if they don't think that the Y is a safe place for them, we can connect them by being an individual ally. Or if they're afraid to call law enforcement, if we have a contact, if we say, actually, I can contact, I can even direct contact the sheriff folder or I can get you into direct contact with the prosecutor's office. That opens doors for people that might think that every door is shut. So we all in this room have a responsibility to step up today uh, and increase our net, right? Um, and increase the width of our impact. Uh, so I'm here today, I'm honored to be here with all of you so that we can increase awareness on domestic violence so that one day we're not having to talk to a room full of people uh, because we will have all the doors in our community open and ready. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. So that was uh, Jay Maddock from Out, Out Front speaking at the domestic violence event last night. Uh, so my friend Lawrence showed up. And uh, we're I think we're going to switch gears a little bit. And uh, as I started out in the beginning of the show, I mentioned the, the, the massacre that happened in Vegas. And we're going to kind of dig deeper into that topic. So uh, I, I just want to preface this by saying, you know, there's, a, there's like a couple of different dimensions we talk about. We, we You know, like the one, you know, of course, like the, the issue with gun legislation, um, you know, I... This is probably one of the few areas where I divert a little bit from the progressive consensus. I, actually, I think my dad's listening. He's, he's a big gun guy. But, you know, even I, you know, as some like I own several firearms and, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more anarchistic. I don't want the government to, like, regulate stuff. But um, at the same time, I've got to look at, like, evidence based approaches and see, like, where where have what kinds of things have worked in other places that um, have made things more safe um, in regards to, to, to gun laws. Um, there's also, you know, you know we're going to kind of decompile the whole like white privilege aspect to it, how, how these shooters get portrayed in the media if they're white versus, um, you know, Muslim, black, um, or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, oh yeah, we're gonna get in, we're gonna get oh, into yeah. it. <laughs> okay. um, so I'll I'll let Lawrence you go ahead because I know you've been you chomping at the bit to really like 
Um, get into man. This. Okay, first of all, first of all, before we get into everything, um, you know, yeah, we we all heard about it. We've all seen the news about what's going on in Vegas. You know, and and for those who are good meaning religious people, you know, who say thoughts and prayers, it's well meaning, um, and that's all, and that's always good. Well meaning. In a country that has more mass shootings than days in the calendar year is a nice way of saying, like like thoughts and prayers, it's a nice way of saying, we're here for you spiritually, but there's really nothing that we're going to do about it actually. And there's a lot, and there's people like me who say that and really mean, you know, really mean it. There's a lot of people who say it and they don't. Folks, they are only saying it because they're they're not trying to look at the bigger issue. That yeah. for a, that for every ten people in America, eight people in America has guns. Yeah. For every yeah, I mean particularly <laughs> like for like Republican politicians, that's like thoughts and prayers is code for this is so I don't have to actually talk about it as an issue. Or, you know, them saying, like, you know, now is not the time to talk about it. Kind of like what they did um, with uh, all the hurricanes that just happened. Oh now is not the time God. to talk about climate change, even oh. though this is, like, the time where climate change is literally happening. Well, but oh, Right, right. Um... I forgot the I forgot the politician who went on who went on TV and basically said this is not time to politicize it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna give it a day. We're gonna give it a day. We're gonna give it a week. Okay, cool. Got you. Uh, what about San Bernardino? What, what about Sandy Hook? What about uh, the Pulse nightclub? Those happened months ago. Can we talk about it now? Mm-hmm. What about what about the fact that it's been we've had seventy. Sev was uh we had we had we've had two hundred and seventy eight days in this calendar year and we've had like two hundred and seventy nine mass shootings. Just like in two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand fifteen, two thousand sixteen, two thousand seventeen, we've had more mass shootings than days in the calendar year. And let's also remember one of the things that has happened since our current POTUS, our current president, took office, he rolled back regulation, an Obama era, a President Obama era regulation that said people who are mentally inept, people who are mentally challenged, people who cannot pay their own bills should be allowed yeah. to get guns. And th- that's hypocrisy, right? Because, like, you know what, what was the talking point Republicans always threw out there with gun control, which I, I in part partially I, I agree with. It's like we don't have a gun problem; we have like a mental health problem. Now I'd say it's less a mental health problem than a cultural problem, but it you know at least with that line of rhetoric, you're pointing to like, oh well, here's a problem that needs to be fixed. And then as soon as like they get control of the house, they like. It's like, so, okay, so we have a mental health problem. So, yeah, let's make sure they they can all be well armed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, no, wait. Right, because uh, uh, some press people uh, pushed Paul, Paul Ryan because Paul Ryan had to speak for it. And um, he actually brought up that talking point that we have a mental health issue. And some of the uh, press brought up the fact that you help President Trump roll back regulations so people who are mentally ill can get weapons you say it's a mental you say it's a mental health problem yet you have just done stuff to make it worse so do you actually care about mental health or do you actually care more about the money that the gun manufacturers and the nra are giving you so you can have less regulation this is and that that's one of the that's one it is a there is a mental health problem in America there's a cultural problem in America there's also a money and politics problem in America mm, which covers yeah. which covers this issue there's logically it makes no sense taking Las Vegas for for an example that on the Las Vegas strip toy guns are banned toy guns like star like Star Wars stormtrooper guns are banned because it was making the tourists uncomfortable but in las vegas in nevada you can openly carry weapons 
So having a real gun on the Las Vegas Strip, where all the casinos and hotels are, is perfectly fine. Having a toy gun what that that's non-lethal is banned. Who is that helping? Who is that benefiting? Is that benefiting the the uh, the club owners that's on that strip? No, because now they have to get extra security mm-hmm. because now now they have to pay for extra security and now they have to worry about weapons going being in their clubs. Is that helping out the American uh, civilian? No, because studies have shown that the myth that a good guy with a gun will stop a bad guy with a gun in that scenario in 2015. That happened only 12% of the time. Out of the 375 mass shootings that happened in in 2015, only 12% of them were stopped by a good guy with a yeah, gun. By, by the way, I actually did hear this argument being used in this, this situation uh, in Vegas. And I, I want to put that in concrete terms for everyone. Like, So the idea is... Uh, like there was like, well, if people, if the concert goers had had guns, they could have. Def- could you imagine like twenty thousand people just blindly shooting at the Mandalay Bay Hotel? Oh wait, 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 hold on, wait, wait, wait. Um, the one of the uh, band members that was playing on the uh, that was playing during the shooting uh, actually came out and spoke about this because uh, I forgot I forgot the guy's name, but he's an uh, active gun advocate. Uh, Secular Talk and TYT has talked about it. Um, they have a segment on it, and they have the guy's name. He came out and said, the, "I forgot the band member, the band member's dude's name." He said, "We had guns there. We have guns on our tour bus. And in the past, I've been an avid gun advocate. I have been completely wrong on this issue because he said, if we were to start shooting in that chaos, when the cops did come, they would have shot us." And Damn. and that happened that in the fact that he had that forethought to think about that is amazing because over eighty percent of the time these good guys with guns get shot by the police because the police thinks that they're the mass shooters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you know. So mm-hmm. so it's it's amazing to me how someone again I'm not I I'm for comprehensive gun leg, gun regulations. I have family members who have guns. My uncle was a Marine. He goes hunting all the time. He has weapons. My dad has weapons. Like, we have weapons at our house. I get it. I understand it. Um, I also understand that in most American households, you are more likely to use a weapon on one of your family members than an actual intruder, statistically speaking. Mm-hmm. I am also, I'm also aware of the fact that depending on uh, that... You're more than likely not going to be able to respond in a mass shooting scenario. There has been studies that have shown it. They have run multiple scenarios. The FBI and other law enforcement agencies have run these scenarios with civilians. Most civilians do not have the reaction or the wherewithal to pull out a weapon, identify where the shooting is going from, and then actually assess the situation accurately. They end up shooting more civilians. And, you know, even, I mean, even a lot of professionally trained people, like, you know, it's it's such a sudden and chaotic moment. You know, you're, this is not a scenario that you're, not, like, anyone is, like, actively prepared for when it happens. So, oh, yeah. and also, let's not, uh, I also want to get rid of that myth. For those who like that argument that if the people in that crowd were to have guns, three things. One, there were people in that crowd who had guns. They chose not to fire. Why? Because they did not know where it's coming from. Two, the shooter was on the 32nd floor. Mm -hmm. What if they missed? That means everyone from the 32nd floor and below all, uh, all those other floors would have been getting shot by bullets and they would not know why. Mm -hmm. Third, third thing. And this is the, goes back to the point that the, uh, that the country music star was singing. If they were to start shooting and the cops were there, the cops would have thought that they were the mass shooter. So these good guys with the guns would have gotten shot and killed. So when we are swimming in a sea of guns in this country, that there for every 10 people, for every 100 people, 80% of us have weapons, you're going to get more mass shootings. It's going to happen. Now, Kalamazoo, I don't have to say, I don't have to remind y'all 
and and say that it will happen in a neighborhood near you. We had a mass shooting here. Mm-hmm. Yep, we did. <laughs> like, can you can you imagine? Like, I'm like, it, it's going to happen in every single neighborhood. It's already happened to us. You do you remember the fear that you had when it happened here in Kalamazoo? I was lucky enough. I wasn't even in Kalamazoo at the time of the mass shooting. I was in. Uh, I was with my uh, couple of my friends in Indiana, but my dad and my mom were here. Yeah, yeah. and they were blo- a few blocks away when it first started. When the killing spree first happened, so I'm panicking, trying to see how my family's doing because they're nearby. And again, I understand. Some of the argument. Oh, one of the other arguments that you hear when it comes to uh, gun control and just comprehensive gun legislation, just like in this scenario. In this particular scenario, we do have we have laws on the books that would not that did not prevent this man to have a uh, have a gun. There, the, what that means is that the rules that we have are not comprehensive enough, nor do they go far enough. So that civilians, so that law-abiding civilians who have the mental capacity to know what right and wrong is, to actually own this weapon. This man was a loner, and he had over 45 guns. 45 guns. He had an arsenal. He brought 22 of them to that hotel. Well, I mean, and and people were saying yeah. he's not a gun. He's not a. He wasn't a gun advocate, or he wasn't a gun person. You have 42 guns and you're not a gun person? I'll say, like, that's definitely a gun person. Right, although like... That, that's, although, honestly, like, that number... Like, you know, I, I mentioned my dad earlier, and it's like, hey, he died his peak. He probably had, like... I don't think he ever had the, quite that many, but maybe, like, somewhere 25 and 30. And that's that's pretty standard number for, like, people who are, like, gun crazy in this country. Um, I mean, okay, if you're going hunting, here's the thing. Yeah. If you're going if you're going hunting and you want to have different stuff to go hunting, I okay, I understand. If you are a, if you just like practicing practicing skeet shooting and you like practicing with different weapons, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. When you have in in my opinion, this is this is a part of I'm I'm for comprehensive gun legislation. I think that this is not too far off of that comprehensive gun legislation, I think if you have more than twenty guns at your house, that you should get evaluated. Like, like you should get, you should get, uh, you should have to annually go see a shrink or someone. You ha- you have to go get mentally uh, evaluated at least twice to three times a year. And if you miss one of those evaluations, then your license gets taken away. And your guns gets taken away. Reason why is because you have all these people who stockpile all these weapons and all these guns, yet it's such a surprise when they start opening fire into a crowd of people because they're angry, upset, alone, or whatever. Like that that makes logically no sense. And also, this is another talking point. Well, assault rifles, you know, these weapons are um they're just tools they're t- they're tools and you know the laws the laws don't protect uh, wouldn't protect us from from this type of mass shooting or any mass shooting so why should we why should we have these laws okay first of all 92% of the NRA supports universal background checks and 92% of the members of the NRA support comprehensive common sense gun regulation and laws so that talking point is not a liberal talking point it's not a conservative talking point it's a common sense talking point another mm-hmm. thing is this talking point of well why should we have these laws criminals are going to get the guns anyway apply that l- line of logic to any other thing that we do in 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 today's society you know Drunk drivers are uh, don't care about the law. They're gonna drink and drive anyway. So why should we have speed limits or or speed bumps? Mm, you know, yeah. you know, uh, bank robbers don't care about the law. They're gonna rob banks anyway. So why should we have security and vaults? Mm. Home invaders they don't they don't care about the law. They're gonna break inside your house anyway. So why should you have locked doors? 
You're impeding my American freedom to make me have to have locked doors at my house. <laughs> what? Well, this, that logically makes no sense. So when I hear people say, you know, criminals are going to get guns anyway, so why should we have laws regulating regulating guns? You're stepping on my freedom. That logically makes no sense, man. It's not that criminals are not going to get weapons. They can. We're trying to stop them from... Uh, uh, stop how easy it is to get said weapons yeah and you know that that's there's something that speaks to that too because you know there are there are a lot of times like you know there is a lot of premeditation that goes into these mass shootings but sometimes um you know these these are like and and it is enabled by the fact that like you can and I'll, there's too many places in the country you can just go grab a gun and like you know again um i'm i'm more on the like kind of less control side of it but i i think it's kind of ridiculous to to think that you know having uh some sort of like background check or waiting period is somehow infringing on your rights like we're talking about like a like a deadly weapon here it's not like you're going out to like buy an hd tv or even even like a car requires more more like sophisticated paperwork than a gun and granted you could use a gun or a car as a deadly weapon but you know we expect people to to take driver's tests and and to be evaluated before they're allowed to drive um, I certainly would be okay with some sort of system where, you know, we do something similar with, uh, you know, uh, with with firearms. Um, Imagine yeah. if we regulated guns as much as we regulate opiates or car or or uh, imagine if we regulated the purchase of of these weapons, like how we regulate marijuana in some states. You know, it the fact that the fact that like like because another another talking point that people will bring up, and this is something that the NRA lady brought up, the NRA spokesperson brought up. You know, arms and legs kill people too. So does cars. Are we gonna ban those things too? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, okay. All right, all right. So this is that's, all right. So to get the to. The, the ignorance of that statement yesterday when I read it completely and utterly pissed me off. <laughs> yeah. We have annually, every year, over 400,000 people die from gun violence in America. So that's suicides, accidents, homicides, and mass shootings. Okay? As a reminder, folks, in 2001, when 9-11 happened, only around 3,000 people died. Rough, rough as around 3,000 people died. Over 400,000 people die every year in this country because of gun violence. That's literally roughly around 11 9 11s. 11 to 12 9 11s, give or take. Mm -hmm. Annually. That's not that's not a that's not a a small issue that is a that's a literal war that we're doing on ourselves and don't think the gun manufacturers and other and other um and uh the in our military industrial complex and our police state do not uh, recognize this gun manufacturers stocks go up every time there's a mass shooting and there's a mass shooting literally one a day in this country why do why do their stock prices go up because people get scared after a mass shooting and they go buy guns if your house is on fire you don't fight that fire by throwing more gasoline and fire on it <laughs> like well, like I mean, like what like it logically in that scenario oh oh my god my house is on fire you know what i should do get a flamethrower <laughs> well, you know, I think, like, part of that, too, is, you know, it's not quite as simple as that. Like, people, you know, like, we we do, like, people do genuinely have this sense of, like, oh, well, I, I need, I, you know, I want to be able to exercise self-defense. And there's also, you know, people who fear that, like, after these shootings that there will be some sort of uh, referendum on, like, banning guns. And by the way, even, like, the most liberal, like, gun control advocates 
uh, out there. Nobody's talking about like banning guns. I'm, outright. I'm, I'm a, yeah. I, I, I would be one of those people who's yeah. like, no, I, I, like that you talk about. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, yes, I'm a liberal person, mm-hmm. but yet, and yes, I want comprehensive gun legislation. But let's think about it logically. Um, high capacity magazines. High capacity magazines and a, a ban on assault rifles. Okay, that would drastically cut down on the amount of bullets you can use to kill people and the heavy powered weapon that's not used for hunting. That's used for that's not used for hunting deer, but used to, for hunting human beings. Oh, and by the way, assault rifles were not legal until the Bush administration. So that, that's very recent. That's not about a right being taken away. That's basically because, and this all really does go back to the gun manufacturers. And like I tell people, like you know, I like my rifle, but I do not like the NRA because <laughs> no, no, yeah. the NRA members. MR NRA members wanted universal background checks yeah. and a and a comprehensive uh and a comprehensive reform on how you can get assault rifles cuz assault rifles are not designed to kill deer or boar or buffalo they're designed to kill humans like that's why the military designed them for the hunting of other human beings the other thing the other thing to add to that is uh yeah, can someone please explain to me why people on the terrorist watch list can buy weapons in this country? People who we have on the terrorist watch list <laughs> can buy guns. Why? Why is that a thing? Why can people who uh, who are mentally ill, who cannot cash a social security check, who cannot handle their own money and bills, who their family said do uh, we have to take care of their bills for them because they are incapable of doing so, they're allowed to buy guns. Yeah, and like what you've seen is like over the last several decades, especially, is um, groups like the NRA and, and the the gun lobby and uh, you know the gun manufacturers all kind of work in concert to keep continuously moving the goalposts. So they will get more and more like out, out outrageous stuff like legalized uh, in, into our countries like the assault rifles. Right now, they're trying to get silencers legalized. Yeah, in, te- in Texas, yes, for those yeah. who don't know, in yeah. Texas, uh, the Texas legislation is trying to, uh, is trying to allow, it will, is, lo- is allowing Americans to buy silencers. Over 12 police unions have said silencers are used to kill cops. Silencers are used to kill, um, uh, to kill Americans and to kill other human beings indiscriminately. So, we do not want those things in the hands of average uh, uh, civilians. Now, what you're going to hear from gun advocates are, well, it's no, well, you need silencers so that the deer and stuff won't hear you. Uh, and I don't want to hear a loud noise when I shoot a gun. You know there is a thing called noise canceling headphones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, there, there are headphones that you can use when you go hunting. You know, and silencers, yes, and silencers, and the American people buying silencers. Think about that. Who is that benefiting? Is that benefiting the police? No, because most because the majority of police police departments do not want c- civilians to have guns. Civilians to have silencers. Uh, is it helping out the American citizen? No, because you're going to get shot and you're not going to know where it came from. So who's it going to help? It's going to help the criminals who have them and the, the manufacturers. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the politicians who are paid by the gun manufacturers and the NRA. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, that's that's oh, right. Yeah. Also, also to add add to that, because uh, I want to talk about a little bit about policy, things that the overwhelming majority of Americans agree with. Cutting back on high capacity magazines, so you won't have as many rounds to kill people. Banning assault weapons because m- multiple courts. Multiple courts have said that assault weapons are not protected under the Second Amendment. The reason why? Because under the Second Amendment, when it was designed, the rifle that they had were muskets. They did not have assault weapons. Assault weapons were not were designed for militias. And if you're not in a well organized or well organized uh, regulated militia like a police or a police union, then you don't need one. An average civilian does not need one to protect themselves. Also, uh. 
a, a uh, there should be a waiting period because a lot of because a lot of gun violence that happens in this country besides murders are suicides and people do take their lives while using while using guns and it will also cut back on the number of killing on um, killing sprees uh the dude in Las Vegas had 22 guns I think 12 of them were assault rifles why why would we lo- uh, oh also cutting back on a gun show loophole having background checks for the gun show loophole mm-hmm. so that you can't go to so Nevada you can't go to Utah get a gun uh, or have that loophole and having a waiting period you have to have you have to do this background check we have to be able to f- actually tracking where these guns are so fingerprinting people actually tracking them to know where these guns are where who has them those type of things these things need to be regulated and controlled. These are all comprehensive things that will cut back and that would make it, yes, more difficult for the average American to get a gun. Yes, but also will make it more difficult for people who are thinking about causing violence. And that's what we need to think about. It's it's one thing to say, this is my right. I want to stand up for my right. And I and I agree because of because I because both my family members who have guns, they're law abiding citizens. I get that. I understand that. But there has to be a point. There has to be a limit. That there, there has to be a limit. If you have forty two guns at your house and you're telling me that you're telling me as an average human being when you have an abundance of something that you really like, that you're not gonna want to use those things and see what they can do. If I have an abundance of music at my house, you don't think I'm gonna want to play the music that I have? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know about that, Lawrence. Cause like, you know, look, a lot of those people, like when you talk about using a gun, usually like their idea is like, let's go to the target range, let's go hunting. All no, no, I, but, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm, but that's what I'm saying. Like, they're going to want to use it in one way or another. I didn't say that they weren't going to use it constructively. Going to a gun range is yeah. using constructive. Going hunting is constructive. There are some people in this country that are not, that don't think constructively. Yeah, that's You true. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but at the same time, but I'm saying that's human nature. Mm-hmm. I like video games. I have a lot of video games at my house. When I go home, I'm going to want to play video games. If I have a, I, I have a bunch of music. Uh, if I have a, if I'm a DJing and I have a lot of music on my computer, or I'm digging in the crates like an old school DJ, I'm gonna want to play my records, cause that's because that's something that I have a lot of that I'm passionate about. If I have a lot of guns, then I'm gonna want to use the guns. Sometimes I'm gonna go in the backyard and and pop off cans. Sometimes if I'm having a bad day, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use it and I may not and it may not be. In the best interest of anyone who's around me, and that's the point that we're getting that we gotta get at. And I'm and I'm saying not I'm not saying everybody's like that. Mm-hmm. I am saying that there it has to come to a point where we can we can regulate and have common sense regulation. There's no reason why Canada, Australia, Af- Amsterdam, any other industrialized nation who's had to deal with shootings, uh, that had to deal with mass shootings, that they can deal with it. And they can have comprehensive regulation and they don't have to deal with the number of mass shootings that we do. Canada goes hunting more than we do. Besides hockey, it's hunting. And they have nowhere near the number of mass shootings that we do. No, I mean, that that's true. And that's something that, and, you know, that kind of goes back to, you know, one of the first things we talked about was like the culture of violence in America. And, you know, everybody talks about mental health issue and like there are countries that have a comparable amount of firearms to us, but you don't see the, these these mass shootings occur all the time. And, you know, I think what it misses you know, we, I mean, let's go back all the way back to like, you know, Columbine. And by the way, sorry to the caller. Um, if you want to call back around six o'clock or so, we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we, you know, all of the things we talk about on our show week to week, income inequality, uh, systemic injustice, racism, the, the, the materialism, the disconnect 
uh, that people feel how, uh, you know, uh, I read this great article. It's t- basically titled Neoliberalism is Creating Loneliness because we have shifted in our culture from this family uh, community uh, kind of based structure to this individualistic, like you do everything for yourself, uh, you know, to the point where, um, you know, most people in our generation, like their default mode, sometimes just like chilling alone in their rooms instead of being out there in community. Uh, you know, like, and when you have that combined with all of these these injustices, these these inequalities, it creates this nihilistic culture where the, you you can f- people who look at orchestrating these mass shootings with all the empathy of like playing around a grand theft auto that's what a system like this can foster and create yeah and that's what gets lost when we talk about mental health problems like no we got a culture problem in this country i i i i agree i i do agree that we have a culture problem in in that we do glorify Mm-hmm. We do glorify a lot of, uh, a lot of nonsense. I do agree with that. Also, and I also agree that you know income inequality and mental Ill, uh, mental health and those things are also factors into also factors into why people have guns, why people have weapons. Um, some people can do it because they want to. That's their recreation. Their recreation is popping off a few shots. You know. Which is fine. I, I I can't get mad at you if that's what you you do to de stress from your day to day. However, <laughs> I can. I we can at least have a a, a reasonable conversation about looking at our society in comparison to every other society in the world that has comprehensive common sense regulation and how we can implement that in our country if we can if we can look at the education system in the rest of the world and how they have free college and how they have universal health care they have free college they have a living wage in most in most industrialized nations if these are the things that we want in our country which we talk about on this show a lot then having comprehensive gun legislation is that very next step because those societies don't deal with the mass shootings that we have. I'll take I'll take uh, Australia for example. Australia hasn't had a mass shooting since 2004. Since we were in high school. <laughs> since yeah, well, since we since we were in high school. <laughs> Me <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> in our country, we have one we have we have a mass shooting almost once to 1.5 times a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, things like Columbine, Virginia Tech, uh the Pulse nightclub shooting, this shooting, um Sandy Hook. When 90% of the country after Sandy Hook wanted comprehensive gun legislation and we did not pass it. Why? Why did we not pass it? That's a question that we need to be asking as a society because the American people should should not only have been more pissed, we should have been holding them accountable as a litmus test. Our our representatives as a litmus test after that. The reason why is because we are literally dying to uphold a freedom that benefits the rich mm, while yeah. scaring the rest of us. Scaring the rest of us because of the propaganda that's pushed on media. So it's a part of the media's problem as well. It's part of media's fault on this as well. But it's literally killing us. And when we finally say we do need some comprehensive regulations so we can cut back on the mass shootings. Maybe we don't have one once a day. We can have we can cut back and, and have comprehensive regulation. You should ask yourself, why couldn't it not be passed? Is it the reason why the NRA and, and gun manufacturers are the third largest lobbying group in Congress? Is that the fact that you have laws like the silencer law in Texas or the fact that you can have open carry in uh, Ohio, in Michigan, in Nevada, where you can take guns, where they're trying to pass laws where you can take guns in public spaces like nurseries, and college campuses, bars, and stadiums. 
Think yeah. about that. Think about that. These are these are the what could go wrong laws where people are being drunk and are full of intoxicants, get into fights, and they are now going to be armed. No, yeah, exactly, and like that's that's exactly a situation where you should not have gun. Like, yeah, like not don't, yeah, not <laughs> those in, are those yeah. are that's the reality yeah. of the world that we live in. Now there are some places like Oregon that's passing comprehensive gun legislation. So I think that is a good side note to the story. So places like Oregon, uh, I think they passed a bill. They, I, I forgot what bill that they uh, they just got done passing when it comes to. Uh, Cutting back on high capacity mags, magazines, and uh, and banning stuff like the AR-15 or the mm-hmm. M16 or things like that, they are actually taking positive steps. There are other places like Texas, New Hampshire, and other places that, or Ohio, that will allow you to carry guns into a nursery. Did you know? And this is something that I realize. I, I bring up the nursery thing. Mm-hmm. I found out that a toddler in America. Shoot somebody with a gun once a week. There is a new story of a toddler shooting a person once a week. So there, so the solution and some of these legislators is that we should allow people to bring guns into nurseries. <laughs> like, like my niece and nephew. Like, like, like my niece, my my niece is th- five, t- uh, two. She just turned three. I won't let her. I will. I will barely let her walk around with scissors because she has a tendency to run a lot and not yeah. see where she's going, mm-hmm. and she will run into a couch or wall or something. You want adults to have weapons around these kids? Are you insane? <laughs> so I, I did want to shift the conversation just a little bit. Uh, I don't know how much time we got uh, with you still here. So, um, you know, uh, one of the things that was really brought up and it really hits home. Um, this has been like one of the biggest ones since Trump got in the office. You know, we have the treatment of of this shooter who uh, there's literally headlines that oh he was a country music fan and he was mm. quiet and he, he was very friendly and you know compare that to like a headline about Tamir Rice you know the 12 year old got shot in in, uh, in Cleveland but it's like well if you're gonna act like a thug we're gonna treat you like one so there's a there's a uh. double standard in the way like they 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 don't they don't want to call this guy a terrorist even though he fits the legal definition of terrorism in the state of Nevada and. Also, let, let's, you know, I'm, this is kind of like devil's advocate here, but this is a, a component of the story that I've been, uh, that I thought about and I've been hearing, you know, from a lot of my colleagues. You know, let's not forget, you know, uh, we talk about gun control, um, but, you know, let's, let's not pretend the right wing only cares about con- gun control when they can use it for, you know, financial leverage for the people who are lobbying them or as a wedge issue in order to pull votes away from, uh, you know, left leaning people running for office. Oh. Because, you know, historical example, where did gun control in this country come from? You know, it started when when the Black Panthers practiced armed self-defense. It wasn't the left wing people who wanted to, you know, get gun control moving and take away your guns. It was the right wing who saw some, you know, black radicals with rifles and it scared them to death and they had to pass some legislation. So Oh, oh, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. And the person that passed that legislation in California, need I remind you, was Governor Ronald Reagan. Yep. Mm-hmm. Was, Ronald Reagan. was yep. Governor Ronald Reagan of California who passed that legislation because the Black Panthers, when they realized that they had a Second Amendment right, walked into a session, walked into an open session in Congress. Oh, mm-hmm. which is also now uh, 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 in many state legislators a thing now. You can open carry guns into state legislators, into into. Uh, town halls and also into places where people are going to be making laws. So think about that. You have disgruntled people in America. They are angry about how politicians are not are not listening to them. And you're going to let them carry guns near these politicians. That's not listening well, to I them. Well, I mean, it just uh, I you know, a couple months ago is that Republican politician who got shot. Um, uh, Gabby Gifford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gabby Gifford also got shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. Oh, but also. 
you did bring up a great point, and I didn't want to overlook it. Yeah, imagine if this shooter was Muslim. Mm, imagine if yeah. this. Imagine if this shooter was Mexican. Imagine if this shooter was black. And imagine and watch how the media transforms this. The uh, he would be a thug, a terrorist, an uh, illegal immigrant. He's 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 a danger to society. He's a white guy with a gun who shoots up a crowd. You know, he's a lone wolf. He was lonely. He was an upstanding. Yeah. Uh, he was an upstanding civilian. It's the demon. Is the 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 uh, demon? Uh, I can't say the word right now. Demonization. Demonization. Yeah, yeah, demonization of minorities in this country is how gun sales go up in this country. Because this is another fact. The majority of guns in this country are in the suburbs of America. Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. is over 70 to 80% of the guns in this country are owned by people who live in suburbs? Not inner cities, but suburbs. Because those people are terrified of the other. They're terrified that people are going to come and hurt them. Do they have a right to own a gun? Yes. But look at where that gun... Look at where the good guy with gun bad guy with the gun scenarios it comes from look at the way that the nra lady um uh that how in california like you said mm -hmm. they they didn't mind the second amendment for all america for all californians before when it was fine mm -hmm. but when the black panthers was like uh no we have the right to open carry that's a part of the law oh my god yeah. oh my, if, if here's the thing I've said this before jokingly and I and I I hope that one day this never happens. But if we could if black people or minorities next time had a million man march on Capitol Hill and the majority of those people open carried on Capitol Hill, we would have gun legislation in this country by that next day. Yeah. <laughs> we, I, I, like, I, yep, like, I've heard that. I, 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 mm -hmm. I hope and pray that that, I hope and pray that that type of scenario doesn't have, it doesn't have to reach that point. It never, it, I hope it never has to reach that point because can you imagine if every time there was a march, like the women's march that happened all over the country, mm -hmm. If all those people were armed, like if if that that it's a scary scenario, that is a terrifying scenario because the right wing in this country they like violence, they want violence. It helps their it helps their sponsors, it helps the people who contribute to them, and that's how authoritarians work. They can't win in the free market of ideas, so they turn to violence. Yeah, and it really, I mean, th there is a whole catch-22 to that because, you know, it, it, it feeds into, uh, you know, like, as, as much as, like, uh, you know, I've said before, like, I'll support Antifa when they're doing, like, organized self-defense, but there is also an aspect to it where, you know, they're now being able to use, and it was like, look, the left is violent. And they're able to kind of like really ramp up this whole idea of a culture war mm. when, you know, again, like everybody needs to understand like partisan differences aside, whether you're left or right, you know, there's the real problem is like the oligarchy, the plutocracy, the people up at the top. And these are the games they play in order to keep all of us separate and divided so we do not unite against them. And, uh, you know, it, and it is difficult because, you know, I, I'll hear like from a lot of, especially even after like the Trump election and people on the left who's like, well, you know, I want to almost uh, echoing kind of like, you know, what, what you hear uh, from right wing people during, um, you know, Democratic presidencies where like, you know, I want to be able to have the ability to defend, defend myself from my own government. And, you know, that. That's honestly like that's an impulse I felt myself. I mean, look, look around like the, the police, the police state we're living in. Um, there's actually this article I'm, I'm gonna I get a chance to talk about. It, I really do. Where the, um, there's this, some legislation they're trying to push through the Mi Michigan State House that would basically allow uh, private 
um, police and security to operate here in Michigan, which, um, one, anybody who's seen RoboCop know that's a bad idea. Oh, Jesus Christ. But as somebody who is at Standing Rock, I'm going to tell you that's a double, double bad idea. Oh, my God. Um, Oh, my God. Uh, Like, okay, okay. Oh, oh my God. Um, (laughs) I'm not going to be here while you talk about that, but I I did want to speak on that for for a hot second. Mm -hmm. If you allow... It, okay, first of all, the police barely have enough training on de-escalation so that they and they dis- <clears throat> they disproportionately shoot people, minorities, uh, 4.5 times more than anybody else. And they have a lack of training on de-escalating. You're going to give weapons and guns to private corporation security and they will be allowed to carry those weapons like any other person and they're not their training is not going to be as good as the police their training is not going to be better because they're privatized you're going to have a massive increase in violence because you're going to because a bunch of people going to be like why is this security guard has a carrying a gun why is the security guard trying to fight me like you i cannot imagine a situation where you're gonna have a bunch of people who are already terrified who are already on the edge and twitching about wanting to defend themselves and now you're just gonna give them more weapons like it 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 makes no sense it, oh my god that makes no sense but the, to, to wrap it up this is also a thing about the mainstream media mainstream media cannot allow politicians to keep saying well you know it's too soon to um, it's too soon to um, not politicize or come up with solutions to our massive problem of mass shootings you cannot allow people to dictate that conversation that that in that way. If you're if they're trying to sidestep or deflect from actually coming up with a solution, then that means they don't care about actually causing a solution. They like the status quo as it is, mostly because it doesn't affect them. It does not affect That's them right. negatively. And then also and also another thing is if you have an if you have if you if you have in any other scenario if i crash my car and i went through the and i went through the and you know knock on wood i don't you will not you you don't think that there shouldn't be a like because of the amount of car accidents that we had in this country we created laws that car manufacturers had to do to make cars safer for everyone we created laws so that people would be safer while cars are on the street we created traffic lights stop signs we created speed limits we created speed bumps we created regulations so people can be safer in our country because vehicles were running people over when they were created Mm -hmm. that's right if we can do that and we created the motor vehicle then we can do something about guns as well it's not in that it's not in the realm of impossibility it's not like we can't do it we just have to see we have to be, have, be brave enough. We have to be brave enough to look at the situation for what it is and have the will to actually do something about it. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's absolutely right, Lawrence. And uh, you know, I, I guess all I'd really add to that is, you know, um, look, you know, if, if you're out there and you know you're you're worried about some sort of you know, backlash against gun ownership that, you know, frankly, it's been like the boogeyman from the right wing that has never materialized. Nobody's tried to ban weapons. Um, um, let me just like, just let, let's look at like common sense stuff, you know, um, it, you know, if you have to like take a driver's test, I think you, you should have to take like a test for guns and Like, suppose, even if you're coming from a place where you don't want any gun legislation, 
Here's something that you can do beyond just thoughts and prayers. You got a friend that owns a lot of guns. Maybe they're a loner. Maybe maybe they, they've they got some problems. Uh, talk to them. And this isn't going to save everybody all the time. That, that Jason fellow who did it here in Kalamazoo, um, he didn't show any of those telltale signs. But nine times out of ten, like the Columbine kids, they felt a- alienated. Uh, the Virginia yeah. Tech. Yeah, Virginia Tech. That kid felt like he didn't have any friends. He felt isolated, alienated. If you think that we should have no gun regulations, you need to be out there fostering connections in your community to make sure that there are not the kind of people with those nihilistic ideas who are going to go out and and cause a massacre. And, you know, that's true of everybody, but especially all you thoughts and prayers folks out there, you need to go out and, like, actually work with people in your community who are at risk. Okay. Otherwise, okay. I, I, yeah, it's like you, it's like you, it's, you, you got to do something. And if you don't want c- gun control, that's that's what it is. It, and, I mean, for for the for the yeah. for the right wing who might be listening to this, we talk about personal responsibility all the time. If you know people who have a, a majority of a, a lot of guns, you know people who, um, uh, who may have the that may be uh have a similar past or a similar um behavior as some of these mass shooters then maybe it's your personal responsibility to make sure that they don't do it maybe it's your personal responsibility to make sure you check up on check up on people like that that's that's something that we can all do until we do something do something about this like but also and something that we can all do and this is something that all Americans can do hold your elected officials accountable yes. and when it comes because because comprehensive gun legislation is something that the majority of Americans want it's not a fringe issue it's not a left wing issue it's an American issue that a majority of Americans support over 52% of Americans believe in a assault rifle ban over 92% of the NRA members believe in a in a um Universal background checks. Keep your account, uh, your uh, your uh, officials accountable, and make this a, a litmus test for them. If they do not do anything about gun legislation, and they don't do anything about uh, to fix the fix this as an issue, as a systemic issue, then they do not get your support because you're worried about your family being shot. Because of their mm-hmm. lack of action. Yeah. But yeah, I got to dip out. All right. Thanks again, Lawrence. It's great to see you every time <laughs> on the show. You always drop some some incredible knowledge on everyone. <laughs> I think we're going to take a little bit of a break real quick. Uh, you are listening to the Hood Rat Strategist radio program only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Your only source for political revolution. has two locations on 611 West Michigan Ave and 185 Romans Road. More information can be found at pedalbicycle.com. It may not be apparent, but hunger is rather prominent.
prominent issue amongst the student body of Western. The Invisible Knee Project is a multifaceted initiative that's aimed to help struggling students. Every two weeks, generous people donate their food to the pantry located in the Fawn Student Service Buildings or other drop-off locations. All you need to do is grab a reusable bag and grab whatever food you need to help sustain yourself. If anyone's unsure when their next meal will be, or if you have a little extra food you'd be willing to donate, the food pantry is your place. If you're looking to help donate, become a volunteer, or just learn more, call 269-387-4742 or email dosa-imp at wmish.edu for details. All right, folks, give me just a sec. We will be right back. again ladies and gentlemen uh this is the hood rat strategist radio program only on 89.1 widr kalamazoo so uh let's just uh i want to jump back onto that topic real quick with the uh private police bill um just give you all a little bit more context of what we were talking about this is an M live article published yesterday uh, private policing bills face opposition from michigan law enforcement community uh, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of read some bits and pieces from it. A pair of bills that would allow Michigan companies or communities to contract with private police agencies met opposition from the existing law enforcement community and the Senate Government Operations Committee on Tuesday. And uh, this, this is a quote. It almost feels like we're putting together a mercenary force to police in some of our communities, said Howell Police Chief George Bassar, who had been in law enforcement for 43 years. He likened the proposed private police to Blackwater, the private company that provides soldiers and security to both private companies and the government. Um, I want to stop and kind of expand on something I mentioned earlier. So I have actually been on the receiving end of some of these these mercenary groups that run as private police. Uh, I, I've literally been hit with one of their tear gas grenades, actually, uh, right, in, right in the shoulder. It kind of smarts. Um, and uh, I'm talking about, uh, so I've referred to my experiences at Standing Rock before, but it's a good example of what happens when we turn over uh, law enforcement duties to one of these private uh, contracted mercenary entities. Tiger Swan uh, and, uh, you know, 
the famous images of the water cannons and the the rubber bullets, the tear gas. Uh, one of the things that really need to be understood is that was a product of their 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 core philosophy going in. And you look at some of the things that got leaked onto the intercept about this. The way they approached the water protectors, myself and the thousands who were there um, at, at uh, the Aseti Sakawin camp uh, and uh, Sacred Stone camp, etc. Uh, they viewed us as jihadist insurgents. I'll repeat that, jihadist insurgents. The way they spoke about us was in terms of like a radical militant insurgency. They talked about like our signs as being like weapons. Uh, it, I mean, it, it would be kind of funny if it weren't so scary. So, you know, that's the idea that, you know, th this is what these kind of mercenary groups really are. And, you know, they try to gloss those. Oh, we're just talking about like mall cops and stuff like that. Uh, the door that this prize open could lead to much scarier stuff. We could see group like potentially and like and the Howell police chief backs me up. This isn't just me like being conspiratorial or concerned radical. This is like police in our state who are saying this is what could happen if this law goes through. This is Senate Bill 593. Um, and uh, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, they're trying to defend it and say, like, oh, that's out of line. Our, our bill does not allow for it, but it does. And, uh, you know, again, the people they brought in to defend this bill talked about it in terms of, like, um, mall shopping and, and, and getting, like, extra security forces. But um, the potential for that is, is really bad. Uh, let me uh, go on another quote again. From the law enforcement people here in Michigan, Ken Grabowski, legislative liaison for the Police Officers Association of Michigan, said the system set up in the bill was ripe for corruption. By not having as stringent of requirements as traditional police departments, he said the, employee, the employees you would hire would probably be the employees that didn't make it into a real police department. Um, uh, Bazaar of Howell again goes on to say potentially we could be hiring security guards from other states without any police or MCOLES training that's the training Michigan State Police have to go through uh, when uh, they're taken on uh, and uh, I should mention um, Sheriff Fuller uh, who I, I was criticizing earlier in the show but I'll give him kudos for this he stood up as uh, testifying for the Sheriff's Association um, and uh he said, I want to make sure that the rights of all our citizens are protected. The property of all our citizens are protected equally. And, you know, inferring that having this mercenary police force involved would be a detriment to that. And again, these are like law enforcement agencies saying this. So, yeah, um, it did not come to a vote. Um, but they're going to said like, it's still at play. There's going to be a future hearing on it. Um... Hey, y'all, we, we call about these national bills. We need to be on top of this. Because, um, like, we've seen, you know, um, I mean, he has, uh, or not he, but um, these mercenary groups are dangerous. And I, I am speaking as somebody who has literally been victimized by one of these mercenary groups. I do not want to see Tiger Swan or anyone even remotely like them set foot in our state to do uh, to do policing. And, you know, keep in mind, it's it's exactly like you said, you know, they they will hire people who, um, you know, for whatever reason, can't make it into Michigan law enforcement. And sometimes that means they're unqualified. Sometimes that means they're too much of a loose cannon to work as a regular police officer, but as a private mercenary. And keep on, yeah, they will seek out people who are more aggressive and uh, take on this adversary ta adversarial tact with the people whom they are policing. You know, we talk a lot of, on the show about how we want to make sure our police uh, do not behave as an ac occupying force. Well, that's exactly what these mercenary groups are trained to do. 
they are trained to look at the communities that they are are licensed to work in as a hostile force, as an oppositional force. I mean, this is this is scary, folks. Uh, and you know, like I, I was thinking about this just the other day, how like you know. I envy California. They just put through some legislation that's going to make um, uh, campaigns more uh, transparent. Election money and politics uh, topic. It's going to make campaigns more transparent about where money comes from. We just passed legislation in the state that basically puts um, uh, it's like Citizens United uh, given a machine gun, uh, you know, in the parlance of... <laughs> Everything we've been discussing earlier in the show, um, Michigan is—it's a—it's a different animal because I've actually heard from a lot of people. You know, when we're talking about uh, advocacy, as far as like activism, as far as trying to infiltrate institutional part politics, if you're talking about like dim enter that kind of thing, the movement here is really strong. But we're not like California. We got most of our state legislature. Is for, like you know, they, they will. We've had stuff enter the Michigan State House about the, that whole running over protesters thing. That was proposed here. It was shot down, but it was proposed here. We've got a very adversarial uh, state Congress and state Senate. Um, again, Michigan is a deep red state that's been gerrymandered to hell, and uh, we've got a lot of, you know, seat like blue islands. A lot of red areas, but those people, you know, they can be flipped. And I'm telling you, you know, this this is part of it. You know, we're talking about privatizing police here. People don't want that. Nobody wants that. Um, and uh, nobody wants that except for the mercenary groups, of course. But um, again, uh, you know, we got to keep a really close eye on what is going on. At state level, because we're again blue activist state, deep red legislature, and they're going to be trying to pass this kind of stuff wherever they can. They have been for years, and we got to be just as vigilant here at home as we are uh, when they're asking us to make phone calls for uh, uh, to save the ACA, all that stuff. If if you do that kind of work, yeah. Um, you know, if if you deign to find yourself concerned about this problem, yeah, you know, make make some phone calls. And this is this is a uh, this is a situation where I actually stand in solidarity with with uh, local police are coming out and saying like this is a bad, 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 bad idea. This is a bad idea. We cannot invite private mercenary groups to work here in Michigan. All right, so. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick little break. This has been uh, You're Listening to the Hoodrat Strategist radio program only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. WIDR would like to remind you to please drive safely. Drunk driving not only puts your life in danger, but the lives of others as well. If you find yourself stranded somewhere, consider calling Drive Safe Kalamazoo, phoning a friend, or having an Uber pick you up. Thank you for listening. is an open slot in the wider clock and could be filled with an underwriting announcement for your local Kalamazoo business. For more information, please visit widerfm.org and head to the support page.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Um, this is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. So we are joined here today with uh, Mr. Eric Cunningham. He is a candidate for the Kalamazoo City Commission race. Um, this is a particularly exciting race. We got um, a seat that's going to be vacated. And uh, um, I know, Eric, you're gunning for it. So... Uh, uh, why don't we open, you know, I just want to make sure there's maybe a lot of listeners out there who don't know, like, who you are, what you are about, so, yeah, just briefly tell people, like, you know, uh, you know, who are you and why, why did you decide to run for city commission? All right, so that's a, that's a long story right there. Yeah, I see, like, I'll, I'll just start off with who I am. Yeah. Um, born and raised right here in Kalamazoo, uh, Kalamazoo product, went to Kalamazoo Public School Systems. Uh, graduated from Western Michigan twice over. Business is kind of my passion, so I got my bachelor's in business management. Uh, went on to get my master's in public administration. Um, I've been working for the state of Michigan for 14 years this month. And the reason why I'm running, um, long story short, uh, I served in 2015 as city commission. I finished up uh, Commissioner Moore's uh, tenure. Um, and that was about 11th month, 11 month span. And when I re-ran, I lost by 60 votes. Uh, and I think serving in that capacity, I saw the opportunity to really have an impact within my community. Uh, and the 11 months just wasn't enough time to get the type of work done that I wanted to get done done. Um, so hopefully this time around, we have a, a better outcome in regards to election. Also, uh, this time around, uh, if I get elected, uh, it'll be a four-year term, so hopefully we can be one and done and really just be really drive home the impact that I'm looking for within the community. So Okay, great. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I want... So, um, you know, I've, I've seen you come speak at the panels a couple times. Uh, yes. You know, uh, me, me, me being the, uh, the, the uh, weird radical political journalist I am. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so we've, you've talked about, like, kind of your business experience and, you know, um, you know um, and much love, you know, uh, another, another uh, local, uh, local, local dude here. So um, yeah. something I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, you've talked a lot about your business experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I, I've really been looking at and that you have a little bit of concern about is, you know, how do we build... Um, kind of like local businesses that are, you know, sourced by people, started by people in the community, sourced by people in the community, really helps our local economy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, do we do we push for, you know, um, local businesses that are going to be kind of, uh, you know, do, use some sort of profit sharing model? And uh, essentially, like, how do we make sure that we pool our resources and talent towards you know our local citizens rather than um you know people from the outside are wanting to like come in and like build up or start their businesses here yeah so i, I think uh you know that hits on a number of topics one you're talking about investment in infrastructure uh and when i say infrastructure not not the basic uh you know water and streets i'm talking about building a uh, sustainable economy that uh, thrives on small business. So that means downtown can't be a through area, it's gotta be a two area. So how do we create that culture? Uh, how do we change that culture as a community? And I think uh, a lot of that starts with the city taking a leadership role. I think uh, with the Foundation for Excellence, and I'm sure you'll have more questions about that, you're talking about uh, opportunity for aspirational uh, things. So, so that should be definitely a priority. And as they did the Imagine Kalamazoo prioritizing, one of the uh, major feedbacks is job employments. Uh, one thing that people don't know about small business or micro business is I think 60% of all the jobs in the United States is all small business. So, uh, you know, when we look at that as a reflection here in Kalamazoo, I think that's prime opportunity to really invest. And so how do we remove barriers for small businesses? How do we remove barriers for those who are in this community, uh, specifically as the, uh, the, the city's job pertains to. Um, and I think that's just streamlining. Um, there there should definitely be a lot of training and education. I've been throwing that word out a lot in regards to education and people have been getting confused like, oh, well, the city doesn't really partake in education. Well, we do. And a lot of us recognize it as uh, 
civil engagement, but I think a lot of it has to do with just education. Uh, and not just education from a knowledge standpoint, but from a wisdom standpoint. So knowledge is, I hand you this book. I just handed you a book of knowledge. Uh, wisdom is saying, hey, not only did I give you this book, but I took you by the hand and, and showed you uh, how to utilize this book. Um, so I think all of these are just small things that we can be really intentional on and impactful on. So that that's kind of been my goal is to kind of uh, remove barriers within the city uh, and make sure that moving forward, uh, this is a priority. And I think when we start looking at small businesses, you're looking at management that's really accessible, really uh, the ability to really uh, engage management on that level. And when you have an accessible management style versus, say, uh, let's think, like, uh, Walmart, just, just Walmart, really like yeah, top down, where yeah, you gotta go through, Walmart, like, corp- you, you gotta, yeah, corporate, yeah, yeah, you gotta reach out to, mm-hmm. you know, someplace in La La Land. Whereas if it's a local, homegrown, I can say, hey, these are the type of issues we are dealing with in, in our community. Uh, we need to employ uh, these type of individuals in regards to felons, and that's a. I think that's a state initiative when we talk about individuals with backgrounds uh, that that really needs to be handled where they remove the box. Uh, the city has already done so where you don't have to report and I, th- I think that that in itself has opened up a lot of doors so i was unanimously appointed to the kalamazoo city commission i have a felony on my record and so you know um i think a lot of that you know a lot of the uh what's the word i'm looking for a lot of the nervousness in regards to hiring somebody with that type of background can be alleviated when you just look at the basics i have a very strong resume i have wanted you know i have done a lot of things within the community so i should be rewarded or at least given an opportunity based on the skill sets that i bring to the table versus one mistake that was uh that happened when i was not even old enough to be out on my own so those are the type of things that uh that i think small business brings to the community and uh that's something that i really want to focus on Okay, great. Yeah, and uh, uh, just just kind of, uh, you, you, I wanted to jump off one of the things you said. So, uh, talk about education, right? And you know, um, yeah, I I grew up in the Edison, and I, I was first class. I actually got the promise. Ha ha! Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh it's it pretty nice. Yeah, was, I already I already got an, um, a bunch of other scholarship stuff too. But, That's amazing. Um, you know, one of the things I do critique about it, though, is like, you know, what more can we do to to utilize that in the communities that need it the most? You know, we've uh, I've looking at some information, especially like, you know, we've seen, um, you know, um, our uh, the African American women, their graduation rates have gone up a little bit, um, but a lot of like the the male population has remained kind of flat. Yeah. And as far as like white people, it really just correlates to where they are socioeconomically. Yeah. So, you know, uh, kind of two things fold into that. Do you think there should be um, a push to focus also on vocational training? You know, that's that's a really you know we have a lo- pretty big job shortage. Um, you know, community statewide and countrywide when it comes to that yeah. stuff. And and also. Um, you know what? What do you see is like? Um, how can we do better to in, engage and uh, get people ready to use that resource in those communities that really need it the most? Well, and, and see, so you know that goes back into business. Uh, when we talk about uh, vocational training, I think that is it a need. It is a need in the community. And a unique thing about Kalamazoo is there are actually a lot of apprentice-style jobs that individuals just aren't able to, or companies aren't able to get fulfilled because the talent base is not here. And that's unacceptable. And the reason why that's unacceptable is because we have Kalamazoo Valley Community College. We have uh, Kalamazoo College. We have Western Michigan University right here in our own community. And you're telling me that the job market isn't, uh, or the, um, the, the, um, term I'm looking for the employee the employee base is not able to meet that need um, and so I think it, it's just a cultural shift I think these are the type of conversations that need to be had within the community I think for years the city vision and the, the, the interaction between the city and Western the city KVCC and the city and uh, Kalamazoo College just hasn't been strong enough I think there needs to be more conversation on uh, how do we brand Kalamazoo better. 
uh, and, and this even goes to larger corporations. There's no reason why larger corporations shouldn't look into moving into this area because there is the ability to quickly assess drop tr job training because um, the infrastructure is there for education-wise. So, you know, how do we br also brand ourselves as the, the, the land of the promise? Um, you bring you in, you, if you're looking to recruit, you have a hotbed of Western Michigan University. You have the opportunity to say, hey, if you bring your kids here and they go through the Kalamazoo Public School System, they'll have a free education. These are all perks that definitely should drive business here, but I just don't think that we are, we as a community have been true ambassadors on selling Kalamazoo and really reaching out to other um, other uh, businesses or even other other uh, municipalities to have uh, a, a larger conversation. So uh, that 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 inside of it needs to be worked out too. But I, I'll say that for another subject. But going back to the promise, uh, the issue is I was born and raised here in Kalamazoo. I was born in at risk area on the east side of town, mm -hmm. and so uh, you know we didn't ha I didn't have the resources. And although there were programs around for me to be involved in, such as um, Pretty Lake Camp or even city programs, I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't old enough to. And my parents really didn't engage with the community on that level, so they didn't know it was accessible. So as a child, I, I didn't, you know, it's that old saying, just pull yourself up by the bootstrap. Well, if you don't have a bootstrap, how are you going to pull yourself up? And, oh, and that's, that's right. Yeah. And that was mm -hmm. kind of the issue. And that's the same thing for the promises. The promise is there and everyone's like, just take advantage of it. But that is still two levels beyond where an individual can even uh, think of. So when I when I got done with high school, I went into to KVCC and I went part time um, and I was able to kind of afford to put myself through school. Well, in the same sentence. I had to take care of school, I had to take care of myself, I had to make sure that mom and dad mm -hmm. could afford their home, yeah. and my first car wasn't because I went out and bought one, it was because my parents could no longer afford it, so they, they were like, you're paying the bill, you're paying the insurance, here, it's your car now, and they just did not have a car, they went without a car for me to have one. So those are the type of experiences that kids are dealing with. Now luckily I had both parents in the household, so now let's, let's, let's take away one parent from the household, and you only have one parent in the household and you're impoverished you know these are the things that we have to take in consideration and now that's not necessarily a, a job for the city per se but i do think that there is some collaborative effort that the city can have with kalamazoo public school system the city can have with uh the the individuals who administrate the uh promise the city can have with kvcc uh, Kalamazoo College and West WMU. So those are the conversations I think that can be had. I think some of them are happening and I, I do think that we can expand on that. And it all goes back to the Foundation for Excellence. I mean, I truly can't explain. I do have a paranoia when it comes to the Foundation for Excellence because there's this extra amount of money and a part of its goal is to go towards generational poverty. Um, mm, yeah. And so, you know, I have a paranoia that history shows when something like that is involved you know you won't see it in the way that you're expecting and so i don't want to be let down and i definitely that's why i really want to step up and take a leadership role too where these dollars are very, being very intentional being very impactful and you can measure them in some way shape or form and i think that's where what i was trying to touch on before was we have to really reach out to other municipalities and benchmark ourselves uh really figure out what is it that they've done that's been impactful and maybe see how we could tweak ours to our community because we're unique in itself so uh just really having those conversations um and another thing that 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 i aspire to do in this role is be accessible and not just accessible to individuals who normally reach out and and touch somebody uh, at the city commission meeting, but being accessible to somebody that doesn't know I even exist. Yeah. And so uh, when I was growing up, you know, not to say even now that I aspire to be in a, a political role or to be a public service in this in this light long term, but. I would have never, I never met anyone outside of, I, I can say I met Fred Upton in sixth grade, uh, but outside of that, I never had access or touched anybody or had the ability to say, 
uh, that's a that's a city commissioner or that's a public servant in, in a political role. I never had that accessibility. So now I want to be able to reach out and do the same for children that, that might be going through the same thing that I went through. Because uh, I mentioned before on the campaign trail was, you know, my issue was just that I think my parents were too busy. Yeah. And their only way to motivate oh, and their only way to motivate me as a child was go get the belt. And that just didn't do it for me. After a point in my life, you know, once I started getting in high school, it was just like, well, the belt is only so much I can endure that. I'll just go on about my business. Well, that led to me having terrible grades in high school. Um, and was it because of lack of, you know, ability to comprehend? That wasn't the case because I know at one point, I was one of the most intelligent chess players in the state of Michigan. Uh, and so, you know, I know the skill and the, the even even my, my teachers would say, hey, he is very intelligent when he takes these exams, he's getting A's on them. But when it comes to getting homework in, he just never turns it in. So, uh, you know, having these conversations and the ability to reach back out to people who look like me or people who are experienced in Kalamazoo like me can relate to so I'm the only one who is a product of Kalamazoo public school system out of the five people who are running that means something to me uh, mm -hmm. I think that yeah. that uh, that should mean something to the voter in that um, you know you want somebody who has experienced Kalamazoo on every level one as a child you want some and, and 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 so forth so you know I hope when people cast their vote on November 7th they they take that into consideration too yeah, and you know, uh, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the hard one now. That's All right, that's right. the hard. <laughs> no, no, that's the hard one. no, no. Um, but I, I will say, like, I think it is very important. Uh, you know, we're gonna have people in there uh, who understand the nuts and bolts of poverty, um, particularly. You know, so you know, we, we talk about foundation of excellence, and you know, I've talked about it on my show, and I, I've uh, that's been good. very that's vocal good. about um, you know the issues revolving around it. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I do want to mention though, like I'm, you know, I there there's been some good things and bad things. I right. don't like how it was started. I don't think there, there like it was kind of ominous, lack of transparency. I like the Imagine Kalamazoo process. It was very inclusive. Did really what needed to be done. Um, uh, there was that recent vote about the restricted gifts. I would that that kind of uh, was a red flag for me. And most recently, uh, there's actually an article in, in live talking about how, you know, it started out, we've got, so there's going to be like kind of a, the, the reduction in property tax, which disproportionately helps people who own the most property. And this article said there's really no way to, you know, trickle that down to people who rent. So yeah. my, my biggest concerns are, you know, so, you know, in your mind, you know, how is this board going to be selected? Because that's going to be the biggest. And uh, also, how are we going to make sure that this gets put towards really tackling uh, the issues and the people that need the money and, and not end up in the hands of gentrification? I really want you to consider this question not, not in the sense that, like, we think that they have some sort of, uh, you know, I'm talking about the donors, yeah. that they have some sort of agenda, but... How can we safeguard this foundation from future abuse? Because, as we know, like years down the line, yeah. like some you know bad people could potentially get into power, either the donors or the city government. How do we safeguard this foundation to make sure that it is not used to manipulate and coerce, or is somehow ends up in the wrong hands? All right. So, uh, from my understanding, the Foundation for Excellence will have two city sitting two sitting city commissioners on the Foundation for Excellent Board, and then the rest will be appointed by the city commission. Uh, and there's a couple things to take into consideration. So I think that everybody who's at the table naturally cares, and I'm an I'm a, a optimist, so I believe, you know, everybody has a positive heart, and they're not out here to be malicious. Um, so even with the Foundation for Excellence, I do think that they're trying to give it in a positive light. Even with the bylaws, even with every, every you know, uh, and, and as commissioners, we will try, and I, and I honestly think everybody that's sitting up there will try to put in as many uh, guidelines as possible. Um, but the reality is it all comes back to the people that serve on that board. 
and even the people that you know even if I wasn't a sitting commissioner and I'm not a part of that selection I do believe that the people who are selected are a passionate about Kalamazoo and b want to see the success of the Foundation for Excellence but as we all know regardless of laws regardless of intent there will be some type of misunderstanding misuse or, or something negative that comes along the line the only way to best circumvent that isn't necessarily partially through you know the guidelines or the bylaws that we put in place but partially by making sure the culture is correct from the jump mm, yeah. um and, and so for me you know when i first got on the city commission one of my issues one of the first thing i did was say all right who is it that I can find to be a mentor? Who can I attach to? Because I didn't follow, for one, in 2015, I didn't, before I got appointed, I didn't follow city politics. I followed it nationally, but mm. but I didn't really, you know, I didn't really engage in the city politics beyond casting the vote when it was time to cast a vote. So when I got into it, my, my learning curve was straight up. And, and like I said, first thing I did is, who was gonna be my mentor? And the first thing I found out was I'm 20 years younger than the next youngest individual. So they pointed me. I'm 20 years younger than the next individual. I'm the only millennial. I'm the first millennial to ever serve. And I found out real quick our ideologies just just differed. Uh, I, I can say that I attached to Dave Anderson relatively quick because uh, I like the way he thinks. He, he's a very uh, strategical thinker. And, and so when he presented things to me, he brought it from both sides. He said, hey, these are the positives. These are the negatives. You know, and, and I think that anything that you bring to the table, you should test it. You should look uh, you should look on both ends of the table to, to really get a better understanding. So no matter the mindset or the philosophy, you should understand both sides of any coin. Um, and I say that to say this. You know, a lot of decisions were made. And when you're making decisions, you take into consideration certain people, you take into consideration a, a certain population, and you're there to represent 70,000 people. But what I found was a lot of people who were at the table were the same people who were at the table 10, 15, 20 years ago. So my goal while I was sitting on the commission was, hey, you know, I know this guy. He's a bright mind. I need to bring him to the table. We need to make sure that he's seated at the table. Matt Millsart, one individual I was able to serve with and... <clears throat> you know, when I ran and I ended up losing by 60 votes, I lost to Matt Mills Art. And I begged Mac to run. And so, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that A, people were seated. B, people had the encouragement to understand that there's no difference between somebody who's been sitting there for 15 years or somebody who's new to the table. You just have fresh ideas and they and they have, you know, new ideas that they're, from their perspective. But the diversity has to be there. Mm -hmm. And so that that's what it all comes back to. And, and so I think being born and raised here, uh, I can relate on some different levels versus the other candidates who are running. Um, and I personally want to make sure that uh, that we are tapping into some of these other resources or different populations that normally haven't had a chance to come to the table. Uh, and, and there are some, and, and we have representatives, I think, from every background, but I think that, I think there is a real opportunity to bring people who haven't been engaged with the city, who are very bright and who are very capable, and make sure that I give a simple, like I said, ambassador, that I yeah. give a simple, mm -hmm. hey, this is the sales pitch, this is what we want to do, this is what, do you think that you can do it? You've been doing accounting in this in this community for the last 20 years or 10 years. Do you think you can come to the table and be an accountant that looks at this foundation for excellence as a child who has been born, as an individual who's been born and raised here in Kalamazoo? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, you've been doing, you've been a, a small business owner here in the community for the last 15 years. Do you think that you would be willing to come to the table and do X, Y, Z? And like I said, even if I'm not there, as a city commissioner, even if I'm not one of the ones that's being that's helping with that appointing, everybody that will eventually come to that table uh, is a doing it for free. You're not getting paid mm -hmm. to be at this table, so that means you 
you are either completely wasting your time or B, you are relatively passionate about this community and you're passionate about this opportunity. And we can't squander that. And that goes back into, you know, the Foundation for Excellence not only subsidizes our, our revenue, but it gives us an opportunity to be aspirational. We need to really figure out how to get back to the point where we're not being subsidized by philanthropists, where our tax base is strong enough to support that. And as you stated, you don't want the small guy to get left behind. Well, how do you do that unless you invest in a small guy, which goes back into business? Mm -hmm. And how do we build how do we build a community that doesn't erase a certain part of it that makes it the diverse community that it is. I love Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo would not be what it is without the diversity that it, it has. And so um, and there has to be an acceptance. Uh, I think that, you know, when you go through downtown and you see a, 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 a building that's painted beautifully and it's awkward, uh, to me it may be awkward, but to you, you're, you're looking at it like, oh man, that's what makes Kalamazoo unique, that little itty bitty square building that's painted with these beautiful colors. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, at where I may prefer for a more sterile look. I may look at uh, something as like the, the new foundry and say, hey, that is a, a beautiful building. Um, but but at the end of the day, I think both sides of the table just needs to be respected. Um, and, that, and that's really what it comes down to. And, and personally, at the end of the day, uh, my job is diplomacy. You know, how do we resolve issues? How do we look at whatever's going on in this community? And how do we come in together on agreement? We just saw a, a, a Vegas shooting, right? Mm. And, and, that, and, and as horrible as it is, the main thing that that should be bringing up is gun control. I don't think either side of the table, now we're talking, you know, Democrat, Republican ideology. Mm -hmm. I don't think any side of the table is saying get rid of guns. Everybody wants guns to be here. That's fine. We want to be able to protect ourselves. We believe in the amendments. But we are also both sides of the table also feels, you know, let, let's let's uh, look at mental health. Let's look at the role. And for years, Michigan has been cutting back on mental health. Oh, I know. Investment yeah. in mental health. Uh, so. Yeah. So so now all of a sudden it's a big issue by the NRA is, no, we're not going to we're not going to make uh, we're not going to make laws to really guideline guide, uh, guide the, the the gun laws. But let's look at mental health. So, so maybe that is an approach we can we can come to the table and be, agree on. But at the end of the day, I think the diplomacy be begins with love and respect. If I respect you and I always respect you, then you will respect me and we'll be able to have dialogue. Uh, yes, we may not be able to come and see eye to eye. But see, one thing that uh, I, I, I spoke to uh, Commissioner uh, Mike Seals, he's a county commissioner. And, and we had an opportunity to speak at WMU in regards to something. I, I don't remember what the topic was, but, but one thing that he brought up, he said, you know, I traveled the world. I, th I think it was with the Army. Yeah. Uh, and so he said, I traveled the world and, and you know, and, th and when you go to other countries, so I've been to 11 different countries. Uh, I've been to Japan twice. And the first time I went to Japan, they said, hey, it's a cultural exchange. And I'm like, I don't know what a cultural exchange <laughs> is. I've been to seven or at that time, yeah. I've been to six or seven different cultures. I mean, countries. So I'm like the cultural exchange. I, I don't get it. So when I went over there and I saw how vastly different their culture was from ours, then I said, OK, so if if if. Half the United States was Japanese and half of the United States was the United States. I would see how we would definitively draw lines in the sand and say we can't see eye to eye. And so I don't feel that we really have that in the United States. I think that culturally, as much as we are separated, we are in the same boat. Um, I just think that, you know, a lot more conversation has to be had. A lot more respect has to be had and just approach people in love and they'll be a lot more receptive to whatever it is you bring into the table. As we see with the new president, uh, you know, he's catching a lot of backlash. Part of that backlash is not just from uh, the fact that you know, he's a strong leader or however he perceives himself. But the fact that he's just missing the respect factor, he's not approaching mm -hmm. people in love. And so he's catching a lot of that backlash because of it. Now, don't get me wrong. People are going to dislike you when you're in a leadership role, especially the leader of the uh, so-called free world. Um, you're going to you're going to catch a lot of, um, you know, you're going to have the good, and the bad. 
I was a city commissioner for 11 months. I, you know, I didn't brush too many people wrong, but I still have people who don't like me for the role that I played or, or the things that I did. Uh, and, and all I can say was, hey, I didn't represent one subculture. I didn't represent one people. I represent 70,000 people and I made the best decisions based on the information that I was provided. And so, so those are the type of things that, you know, just take into consideration moving forward when we're trying to build this board is... Uh, you know, how do we make sure that diversity is at the table, age-wise? Uh, all demographics, all demographics need to be diverse that are at the table. Somebody that that that, and that that's one thing. When I as I'm running, I am a young black male. Granted, uh, Jack Urban, you know, he's a, a older white male. When he looks at policy, and he's trying to determine how that's going to affect a, a demographic within this community, he's not going to be able to, to really present the perspective that I have. I will automatically say, oh, no, that's going to, you know, I look at something and it's, and it's bright as day to say, hey, that's going to affect uh, the African-American community in this way, that or the other, uh, relatively easily. Well, if you look at Jack, well, Jack is not going to be able to, to, you know, grasp it as quick as I would. But it, it flipped. Uh, the roles reverse you know if it's something that's going to affect the elderly population i wouldn't be able to you know make that decision or i wouldn't be able to look at it and, and have the same perspective that jack has because jack mm -hmm. is elderly yeah. or I, sorry jack you're not elderly you're just older <laughs> uh but um but those are the type of things that you have to take in mind when you when you're making those type of decisions uh and so you know just understanding the individual's history so even even though i say that you know, Jack may have spent 50 years, you know, in an at-risk population, you know, but uh, just like I grew up with Granny. Granny was my best friend. When I got older, uh, I was able to go through college. I, I lived in a duplex with my grandmother, so I was able to take care of her go through college and still work for the state and, I, and that was my infrastructure was provided through grandma so I know what that transition went from uh, when she was able to take care of herself to alright Eric you need to step up and make sure that this that and the other is going on or make sure that she's taking her pills or make sure that she's getting to her doctor's appointment or making sure that her groceries are stocked up and you know that she loves her celebrity from 7-Eleven so make sure that she is uh, making it to 7-Eleven once or twice a month or you know she enjoys pizza so let me make sure that I go down and spend some time with her or even just you know general conversation these are the type of things that I think that the older population is looking for also is to really be at the table too. So, uh, you know, I think that oftentimes, you know, we forget about the individuals who are at the nursing homes. But as I've learned and more, I, not even just from, you know, my growing up with gran granny and grandmother, but being on this campaign trail and really talking to individuals and, and having those face to face conversations, finding out that, you know, I, you know, uh, I served on the such and such board when I was back in the 50s or 60s and I'm just like oh wow it's a wealth of information first yeah. thing I do is let me know more yeah. you know let me get further information well would you would you like to do that again and they're like and they're all re-energized to even be a part of the Cunningham campaign and so you know these are exciting uh, stories that that I think that that you have to be intentional mm -hmm. about trying to do and, that, and that's what that's what all it's about for me is I always want to be intentional to bring as many people to the table uh, as possible. And it's not just about uh, it's not about, hey, Andy, I know you I think you're great. I want you to sit on this board. It's about, hey, Andy, I know you're great. I'm going to have ask you to sit on this board. I'm going to ask John. I'm going to ask Susie. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask 50 people because out of those 50 only three will say yes mm -hmm. and out of those three i think those you know individuals obviously if i'm approaching you can meet the need and so i just want to make sure that that those conversations and are being had uh that we're being intentional about reaching out to the community for this board i think uh you know when i get older and and then i have grandchildren you know, that's one thing that we're going to be looking back on is are we uh, fiscally safe still? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the Headley Amendment, how it's restricted uh, our ability to, to, to leverage taxes and, and different things that, that have uh, policy-wise affected the city, uh, 
if we knew what we knew 20, 30 years ago, now, what we knew, if we knew then what we know now, then, you know, a lot of those decisions wouldn't have been made or we would have, uh, or we would have at least approached a couple of things along the way a little differently. So um, I just want to make sure that the best and the brightest are at the table uh, and that it serves diverse populations and it serves a diverse community that we are. All right. Well, you know, thank you so much, Eric. Um, <laughs> and, you know, good luck out there on the campaign trail, my friend. Hey, I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. And thank yeah. you for uh, having me today. It, it means a lot. You know, I, one thing that I, I've been kind of um, frustrated about on this campaign trail is that, you know, a lot of organizations are, are, are trying to have either forums or a lot of people are trying to uh, be engaged, but they don't, when it comes to the voting, Mm -hmm. That's the most important part. So if 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 on November 7th and you plan to vote and you have a little extra time, it's not just about your vote. It's about educating other people to vote, too. And so uh, Michigan.gov uh, backslash vote. Very important utensil that I personally use. And I try and engage everybody on, hey, are you a registered voter? Do you know where you're supposed to vote? Mm -hmm. And it gives you yeah. a calendar uh, and, and educates you on voting. And then ericcunningham.net. Uh, go out and learn about Eric. Um, make sure that even if I don't get your vote, that's fine. But at least you are educated and you're making a decision on who you want to who you want to represent you. And there are five candidates. If you want to know a non-biased uh, platform, reach out to Legal Women Voters. They have done a very excellent job on making sure that it's a non-biased uh, that they provide non-biased information and try and give you uh, topics. That uh that that are, are important right now, and that should be important to you as a Kalamazoo uh, native or individual who lives here in the community. Yeah, they they ran a really good forum too. Was, yeah, uh, they, they did. But yeah. but you know, and it goes back to not enough people were there. You know, I, yeah, I really yeah, yeah. you're in the Edison mm -hmm. neighborhood, and and you know, it's not that it's their fault or anything of that nature, but. The off-year elections are, aren't always taken as serious as they should be. And when we look at our next future president 30 years from now, those are typically built on this ground level. Mm -hmm. So whoever you put in this commissioner seat, whoever you put in this mayor seat could potentially be the next president of the United States. And so you have to take that into consideration, too. Uh, but not only that, but the dollars that... $140 million is our, our city budget. Approximately, I think, 80 or $90 million is the county budget. So within just the county and the city, you're talking, you know, you're talking over 600, 700, 800 million for the next four years. For whoever you put into this into this role, they will have a responsibility either directly or indirectly to make sure that those dollars are impacting you the way that you want them to impact you. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry to, to oh, tangent no. off I mean, again, but I, mean, I just wanted to really, really praise you yeah. Yeah. For, for being visible to using your platforms to engage politics. And not everybody has, you know, the time to do so. That's and true. there are yeah. some that who do have the time and the passion for politics and don't don't utilize that. But then for those who don't, you know, my my uh, my suggestion to you is if you aren't following politics, that's fine. You may not have the time. You may not have the energy, but reach out to somebody you trust who does follow politics. Ask them who you should be voting for and go cast your vote based on your trust of their uh, their advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know I say that time and time again. You know we people always engage around like the big presidential elections, but yeah. you know I mean like who you know what you plan to do is going to more directly affect you know all the people living here than you know what happens in Congress or with yeah. the president in the next four years. So, Correct. So you know that's really important, and you know uh, touching on that too, I think like you know. Uh, Knowing kind of what it's like to grow up in working class or in poverty, it is hard for people to kind of allot that time for local stuff. But exactly. I'm, I'm hoping, like you know, if you're you're at work, you know, you you know, whether whatever you're doing, you know, you're on the factory line, you're flipping burgers, you're, you know, uh, put in your earphones. Uh, this is gonna be on YouTube, just so everybody knows. So um, you got some friends who are gonna be voting. Uh, or should be voting on the November seventh election. That's right. Take them this way so they 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 can be informed. They can know what's up. That's right. So if you have a felony, you can vote. Uh, if you have five felonies, you can vote. Uh, Michigan.gov backslash vote. Uh, if you're if you need an absentee ballot because you won't be available on that date, 
you can uh, you can mail in a, a, a letter and say hey um, but there are certain criteria you got to make sure you meet on that letter but you can mail in a letter to ask for absentee ballot you can go down to the city clerk or the county clerk and get more uh, absentee ballot uh, and like I said go to michigan.gov backslash vote make that uh, priority if you are under the sound of my voice right now to make sure A that you're registered to vote and that your family members are registered to vote all right. Well, we went in a little bit of overtime, but I'm glad we did. So um, I, I guess we'll wrap up. Um, or anything else you want to say about your campaign before we close it out? Uh, EricCunningham.net. If you would like to sign up to volunteer, if you would like to receive a yard sign or anything of that nature, or even if you just want to find out more about Eric Cunningham as a candidate, uh, I am definitely accessible. Um, even past the election, uh, if I'm seated, then I will want you to even be more of a voice in this community and make sure you reach out. If you need somebody to come and speak at your local church, if you need somebody to come and speak at your local school, or even if it's your employment and you want them to be a little more educated on this uh, election process, uh, November 7th is a very important date and I think it will define Kalamazoo for years to come. Um, so I'm excited about it, and I hope that you guys are too. Uh, just make sure you exercise that very important right to vote. All right, y'all. I want to thank y'all for tuning in. It's been the Hood Rat Strategist Radio Program. The preceding thoughts, views, and opinions are not necessarily those of 89.1 FM, WIDR, Kalamazoo, or Western Michigan University, no matter how dope or insightful they might have been. So uh, tune in next time, every Wednesday, 5 to 7. Thanks for tuning in and uh, keep keep working for that revolution solution. Y'all have a good night.